Hey, Catalyst community. We just finished an interview with a legend, Dr. William Miller. He's the author of Motivational Interviewing, but he's not just the author of the book. He, along with Stephen Rolnick, came up with the concept back in 1983, and it's being used more today in more settings, in more ways to change the world for the better than ever before. This is big stuff. This is a big interview. Super excited. It is the 200th episode of the Catalyst Health Wellness and Performance Coaching Podcast. If you're a subscriber here on the YouTube Coaching Channel, though, we want to get it out to you early. So enjoy the interview. Let's jump right into it, and let's go be a catalyst. Dr. William Miller, what a privilege. Thank you for joining us here on the Catalyst Health Wellness Performance Coaching Podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, you know, most of our listeners, especially after the intro I just gave about you, have heard of motivational interviewing, but how would you describe MI? How, how would you lay that out for us or for someone who hadn't heard of it before? Well, it's a way of having a conversation about change. That's kind of the opposite of telling people what's wrong with them and what to do. And is more about <clears throat> inviting them to tell you about their own reasons for change, uh, their own motivations for change, and their own ideas about how to do it. Yeah, I think 100% of the people listening are nodding their head going, why are we not getting more of it? Like, as you say that, it seems so obvious. It doesn't help for me to tell you what to do or for you to tell me what to do. And, and yet we fall into that trap. Why, why, why do you think that is? Well, it's, it's usually done with the best of intentions, trying to be helpful. And indeed, it, it is the profession for many people to give, to give advice and uh, kind of make suggestions and so on. And sometimes that is what people want. I mean, with, if they come asking for that, if they come asking for ideas, uh, well, by all means, you offer your expertise. Uh, but if, if you really want to help people make a change, you need their expertise also because they know more about themselves than anybody else in the world does. <clears throat> and there's also the, just the fact that telling somebody what to do, the, the average outcome is that they either won't do it or they'll do the opposite. <laughs> it, it, it's called psychological reactance. It's just something in us that doesn't want to be told what to do. Uh, and that's kind of accepting a one down position in a way. We're willing to do that sometimes if you, if you enlist in the military, you, you accept that you're going to be taking orders. I mean, that's, that's part of it. If you enlist in a religious order, you take a vow of obedience, and that's just a part of the deal. Uh, and to some extent, when you, when you go to a health specialist, you're asking for their expertise and advice. And sometimes it is something they can fix. You know? So uh, there's a place for that. <clears throat> but in, in most conversations about change, you're better off finding out about the person's own motivations for and ideas about change than coming up with your own. I mean, their, their ideas are likely to be better than mine are. Uh, and my motivations for them to change are irrelevant, really. Uh, what, are, what are theirs? And so, they, you know, this makes common sense. I mean, most people do not like being told what to do. Uh, and yet somehow when we're trying to be helpful, that's what we are most likely to do. So we call it the writing reflex to, to make things right, to, to set it right, to um, just encourage people to do the right thing. Gotcha. Uh, you've described the relational spirit of MI. And, and folks, when I say MI, motivational interviewing. So I'm going to slip in and out of that every single time. But you described the relational spirit as, it quotes, a collaborative partnership style, one that respects people's autonomy, to choose their own life course and one that takes from their own wisdom rather than trying to install something in them all within an atmosphere of compassion. What do you mean, first of all, the spirit of MI? What, what, what is that referencing? What is that talking about? Well, it, it's talking about a hard learned lesson uh, early in the development of uh, motivational interviewing. When Steve Rolnick and I were teaching workshops, uh, we were focusing on techniques, uh, and then we watched people doing what we taught them to do, and we were horrified <laughs> because we, there was something missing, obviously. We, we had obviously, it wasn't their fault. It was our fault. We had obviously left something very important out, uh, and what it was is, is what we now call the spirit, the underlying mindset or heart set 
with which you practice this. Uh, and without that, it's like trying to use techniques on people and uh, people feel that right away it's, and it doesn't go well. So the, the pieces that you were talking about in there are kind of prerequisite mindset pieces that I'm talking to a person who has free will. I'm talking to a person who gets to choose whether or not they're going to do something different. And that has to be okay with me. And I have to know that that's, that's mm -hmm. how it is. I, I don't get to make those choices for the person. No matter how hard I try to persuade them, I don't get to do that. So that autonomy piece is important. The partnership piece is important that, yes, I have some expertise. And so does this person I'm talking to have tremendous expertise about themselves. So it's a kind of meeting of expertise. There's uh, acceptance of people as they are. Uh, and ironically, that helps people to change. When you feel unacceptable, you kind of frozen mm. uh, and it's difficult to change. And for whatever reason, when you experience acceptance as you are, it becomes possible to change. So that's important as well. And then compassion, just that the reason that I'm sitting here as a helper is the other person's well-being. Uh, not, you know, this is not about me. It's about the other person. Uh, about the alleviation of suffering, about the promotion of happiness. Uh, that's what I'm doing here. So yeah. remembering those things and having those in your mind and heart to begin with, then makes the techniques work okay. Uh, without that, it's the words without the music. Wow. Wow. I, I love that. The words without the music. Uh, so the, the coaches, the counselors, folks that are in the addiction world, they're hearing you and they're nodding their heads like, yeah, 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 exactly. But for the rest of us, that sounds opposite. So as a, a parent, we have three kids, teachers, my, our daughter's a fifth grade teacher, friends. If, if, if people have their own wisdom, why aren't they slash we slash I using it? Well, you use it for yourself, but it, it, we get in trouble when we're trying to help somebody else make a change you know? and just have this idea, uh, at least that we need to tell them what to do, which isn't necessarily true or even necessarily helpful. Even the, the kind of peculiar, somewhat American idea that people will change if you can just make them feel bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not true either. <laughs> Uh, and yet shaming and blaming and all of that is something that we can fall into trying to persuade people to change. It just doesn't work well. And in terms of parenting, I think one, one thing that motivational interviewing has to teach us is what not to do. You know? mm -hmm. that, that when you get into head-to-head -head arguing about who's going to win, if you, the other person's a teenager, you're not going to win. You know, it, it's uh, <laughs> it, and it's not about winning. It's about collaboration. It's about working together and understanding and moving forward together. So uh, I, I think it's just that we have some mistaken ideas that we know are not true about people working with us, but mistaken ideas about how we can be helpful to other people. Mm. And that often is to do with explaining, telling, persuading, uh, advising. Uh, and while there's a role for that, it, it usually doesn't work very well. Wow. Wow. So it, it's not just good listening. And I, I want to make sure we emphasize this. No. Motivation is not just being a good listener and, and, and drawing that out. It involves, it involves this guiding nature. Can you explain the role that that plays in this process? Yeah, but good listening is essential. Sure. So without it, you're not doing motivational interviewing. Uh, so that's a first thing to learn. But it's it's not just sitting there listening well. It is uh, a guide is the best metaphor we've come up with for this. If you think about you go to another country and you hire a guide, what do you want from them? You don't want them to order you around. Uh, you don't want them to decide mm. what you're going to do. You know? Uh, but you do want their experience. You do want what they know. Uh, and so a good guide listens, finds out what, what you'd like to experience. What are you interested in? Where would you like to go? What would you like to do? And then uses their expertise to help you get there safely, um, maybe affordably, enjoyably. Uh, 
Uh, so it's, it's kind of walking beside, you know, not out in front pulling the person, not standing behind pushing the person, nor do you expect a guide to just follow you around. Uh, uh, it, it's that kind of collaboration of, of um, what, I, what I want and what the guide knows. You know? uh, and, and so that's another key piece in motivational interview. And in particular, arranging the conversation in a way that we find out what the person cares about, why they would want mm. to make this change, and what are their ideas about how to do so. Uh, so rather than starting with my ideas, and the things that I think maybe the person should be the motivations, I want to start with what the motivations actually are that the other person has. What, where are they with this? What's going on? Uh, and what ideas do they have about why and how to move forward? Excellent. Excellent. All right. You've written a book for healthcare. I've got it right here, Motivational Interviewing in Healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. how, what, what are you seeing in that arena? Are you seeing it? being utilized more. I come out of healthcare, our son's in med school right now, our daughter's an occupational therapist. So that's part of our world. What are you seeing from your book, from other interactions that you're having out there in the world in terms of healthcare? Sure. Well, when, when you get trained in healthcare, usually you're expected to have answers. So when you're coming through medical school training, for example, having the answer on the spot, being able to provide it, I mean, that's, that's what gets reinforced. And sometimes that's useful. If, if you're working in the emergency room, knowing what to do and doing it quickly is, is important. When you're working with people over time, like in primary care, and what you're talking about is changing the person's behavior or lifestyle, you need a different approach. So I, I suggest a decision tree when I'm working with healthcare professionals. If you can fix it, and if the person wants you to fix it, do it. You know, if it's a broken bone, you know how to set the bone. That's what they're asking you to do. Fine. Well, it looks like it's an infection. You know how to diagnose infections, figure out what it is, probably is, um, prescribe an, an uh, antibiotic. Fine. Do it. But most of what's going on in primary health care has to do with behavior, <clears throat> has to do with the way we live our lives. Most chronic illnesses are lifestyle illnesses. And the course of recovery from illnesses generally has to do with behavior, with what you do uh, and how well you follow uh, what you need to do to be healthy and so on. <clears throat> Diabetes being a good example, a really common illness in our society. And what's going to happen with your diabetes depends in large part on what you eat, your physical activity, uh, you're taking care of yourself, you're monitoring your sugar levels, uh, uh, keeping your stress level down. I mean, those, those kinds of things make all the difference in the course of the disease. And that's the norm in managing chronic illness. That's the norm in primary care. So the other side of the decision tree is if, if you can't fix it, if this is a matter of behavior, if this is a matter of the person doing something, you need a different approach. If you can fix it, fix it. But if what you're talking about is something that requires the person to make some changes in the way they live their lives, you need a different approach. And that's what motivational interviewing is. Uh, and the usual approach of prescribing what to do just isn't terribly effective. Um, maybe two, 3% of the time, people will do what you tell them to do, but most of the time, no and you need an approach that's more likely to engage them and get them to, uh, to do it. Now, this is not just limited to healthcare, by the way. It turns out ambivalence is a very common phenomenon in, in human nature. It's pretty much everywhere. It's our, it's our daily experience. <clears throat> and if you try to persuade a person who's ambivalent, or you argue for one side of their ambivalence, they naturally argue for the other side. <laughs> That's just human nature. Sure. So, so if, if you're a physician and, or a nurse or a social worker or you know, a physical therapist, whatever, talking to someone who needs to make a particular change in order to be healthy, and you argue for that change, you can expect that their response, their normal response, will be why they don't want to do that, or why it won't work, <laughs> or what they kind of argue back. 
you're just acting out the person's ambivalence, but doing it backwards. Because as you cause them to say why they don't want to do it, why it's too hard, why it's too, it's too difficult, uh, they are literally hearing themselves arguing against change. And who are they going to believe? Right. Right. They're going to believe me or they're going to believe what they hear themselves. themselves. Yeah. yeah. So we're more, we're more persuaded by what we ourselves say. Uh, in fact, in some ways, we don't know what we believe until we hear ourselves say it. Uh, so you're either talking yourself into or you're talking yourself out of uh, doing something. And, and literally, that's the process. And which of those is happening depends very much on the helper. The way in which the helper approaches the conversation influences the extent to which people are talking themselves into making a change, which we call change talk, or arguing against it, which we call sustained talk. And that balance actually predicts whether it's going to happen or not. And that balance is very related to what the helper is doing. So as you're saying this, people are maybe hearing this for the first time and saying, oh my gosh, like that makes so much sense. What would be a starting point? So if we've got a physician, a PT, a, a counselor, somebody who is like, well, I've heard of MI, but I've never really looked into it, but this makes so much sense. What would be a starting point for them? Yeah. Well, I get, sometimes I get invited to teach uh, MI over pizza at lunch, you know, <laughs> and, and what I do is try to send people away with something they can try that afternoon. Now, it's not going to be motivational interviewing per se, but sure. it's something like it. And just, say, just, just try this and see if you get a different kind of response than you normally do. Now, there are all kinds of things like uh, you can you can simply ask why would it be important for you to do this, rather than telling the person why it's important to do it. You can ask what ideas do you have about how you can actually do this. Given what you know about yourself, how might you go about it to succeed? Instead of starting by telling them what to do, we have we have scales that we use, zero to ten scale. How important is it for you to do this? Zero is not at all important. 10 is this is the most important thing in my life right now. What number would you give yourself? And, and why that number? Why not, why not zero? Why not a lower number? Why did you choose a four? Uh, just try that. Now, the, you know, I haven't even explained why you're doing that. But these are things that, in a way, give a taste of motivational interviewing to the provider and to the client for that matter. Uh, and usually people respond quite differently than they would to telling them what they need to do. So then I say, if, and if, if the way that people respond looks interestingly different to you, come back and learn some more. Yeah. Or you can read this book or whatever, but at least gives you a sense of it. Perfect. Perfect. And I was showing you the books we've got before I came in to the interview folks. So this is the, the classic MI. Mm -hmm. You've got a new one. You showed me, let's throw that up on the screen. We'll have a link to oh. that in the description, but throw that up so people can see that. Is that just out now? It's just out this week. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It's called on, on second thought, how ambivalence shapes your life. Now this, this is for everybody. This is, this is not written for health professionals, although they're welcome to read it. But I just got so interested in the phenomenon of ambivalence. Uh, and it turns out we know an awful lot about it. So I read all kinds of research on the topic. Absolutely fascinating. And I, I came away with, with the perspective that ambivalence is a virtue. Huh. That being able to look at both sides of things and weigh them and really think about it and, and make a conscious choice. I mean, that's, that's human nature. Yeah. I, I would rather have an ambivalent leader in that sense than someone who has pre-decided what they're gonna do and just goes ahead and does it. Right. I'd rather have a leader who wants to consider the possibilities and talk it. it over with right. people and then make a decision about how to move forward. So in a way that it's fundamental human nature. Uh, at, at the micro level, you probably make hundreds of these decisions every day. Uh, but at a more macro level, these are some of the most important decisions you make in your life. Yeah. So, Anyway, I just wrote about uh, what ambivalence is, what it looks like, how it works, 
how not to approach people who are ambivalent, and what's helpful instead, how to work it through yourself. Uh, and also when you simply accept that this is where you are, that I feel this way and this way at the same time, and that's okay. I and mean, that's, I have mixed feelings. That's just where it is. It doesn't have to be resolved. So that's my bonus for this interview. I didn't even know you had that book out. It is on my list. I will pop that into the, the order here soon. So Sabrina, one of our mentor coaches at the Cattles Coaching Institute, she wanted to be sure we got your thoughts about the skill of summarizing. She works with a lot of coaches. She's, she's found that sometimes the summarizing piece basically is too much talking on the part of the coach. Do, do you have a suggested limit or, or recommendation maybe it should be one summary every 20 minutes or keep your summaries to less than 30 seconds. Is there any general guidance for counselors, coaches, other folks that are using this skill in terms of that summarizing piece? Well, summaries vary a lot. I mean, in, in a way, a reflection is a summary, uh, is a response to something you just heard. Now, ideally, it's not just repeating what you heard. Uh, I talk about continuing the paragraph of saying what might be the next sentence in the paragraph, but that's a kind of listening and, and giving a response. Uh, when we're listening for change talk, which we know predicts people's likelihood of making a change, when I get two or three of these reasons, uh, then I'm likely to kind of give a quick summary of those. So, so far you've told me that you think if you quit smoking, you'd have more money to spend. Your, your kids would be pretty happy. Uh, and you'd have better wind on the soccer field. And the, what else? You know? <laughs> now, those are things the person has said. I'm, I'm pulling them together. Uh, but doing that very strategically, because I, I've, I've arranged the conversations that the person, first of all, tells me those things in the first place. I reflect them so they hear me saying what they said. Then I come back with a summary and kind of pull them together into what we call a little bouquet. You know? and offer that back and see if there's some more flowers to add to the bouquet. But that's part of the process of trying to hear as many of the person's own motivations for change as I can and <clears throat> offering them back to the person again. And once, once you get up to a nice size bouquet and you hear all of your own reasons pulled together for making the change, that's, that's pretty powerful. And, it, and it's coming from you. It's not somebody giving you a list of reasons, but it's your own stuff. Right. But it's what you don't do normally when you feel ambivalent. Uh, the normal response is to think of a reason why you should do something and then think of a reason why you don't want to do it and then stop thinking about it. <laughs> and so you go around in circles. Um, and this is a way of helping people stay with the process to keep thinking about what would be important about this? What, what, what might be better about this? How would you go about doing that? Well, how important is it to you? And to just stay on that trajectory, which is how you get out of the forest. So in, in the example you gave, it was very brief. It was succinct. It was to the point. It was this bouquet of two or three points that I had made uh, if, if I were your client. Is that kind of what you're recommending in terms of Sabrina's question of, you know what, it's not you sharing your wisdom with the world. It's you no. doing a quick summary of what they've shared with you. Well, and what do you put into that summary is important also. Uh, and often people aren't conscious about that. How do you decide what, if you're going to, like at the end of a session, do a big summary and say, well, okay, here's, what I, here's what's happened today. Tell me if I missed anything. How do you decide what to put into that? Because you're not going to mm. put everything in. Right. Uh, one guideline, not from us, is well, put in all of the feeling statements. Put in all, everything the person has said that has some emotional content to it. Well, if you're working with somebody who's a relatively new client, probably most of that is pretty unpleasant affect. You know? mm. uh, and so you're going to be giving them a whole load of negative emotion that you heard. True enough. But where does that leave the person? Pretty discouraged. Right. They didn't actually need to hear all of that again. So that's not necessarily a particularly good a guideline. Uh, do you want to give a summary that is all of the person's pros and cons, all of their reasons for and all the reasons against, Jane? 
That's what's called a decisional balance. The expected outcome of this of doing a decisional balance summary is ambivalence. That you leave the person where they started, which is feeling both ways about it. And that's not necessarily what they came to you to help them do. Right. Uh, in motivational interviewing, what we're doing in a summary is what I was doing in that quick one, which is pulling together the person's own reasons for and ideas about change. And it doesn't have to go on a long time. I, I prefer brevity in reflections and, uh, and brevity in summaries. Uh, but the key thing is, what are you putting into that summary and why? There are also summaries that are kind of like the prosecutor's uh, closing argument. You know? Well, here's all the things that are wrong with you, and here's what you need to do. You know? uh, so it, it, it matters what you put in a summary. It matters what you reflect. You know, for example, if you're talking to a smoker who says, you know, I, I know I ought to quit, but I just really love smoking, and I don't think I could do it. You know? What do you reflect? You could reflect, you, you don't think you could quit smoking, you know, to which you'll hear more about why the person can't quit smoking. You, know? you could reflect uh, how the person doesn't want to do that, you know, that, it, that smoking really is important to you. Perfectly good reflection from a Rogerian client-centered perspective. But if you reflect to the person you really enjoy smoking, you'll hear more about why the person enjoys smoking, which is sustained talk. It's just, talking right. yourself into continuum. The thing that you would reflect out of that statement I just gave you is, yeah, and yet there's something in you that knows that really you ought to quit. What's that about? You know, that's where you shine the light. When you're reflecting something, you're shining a light on a particular part of what the person said, and that's what you'll hear more about. So it matters what questions you ask. It matters what you reflect. It matters what you affirm, mm. uh, what you reinforce. It matters what you put into summaries. And when I was being trained in person-centered therapy, I, I was taught to do those things, but never was I told much about what to reflect or what to ask or what to summarize uh, or what to affirm, just to do those things. And it turns out it matters. It really matters what you, what you ask, reflect, affirm, and put into summaries. And it helps a person move and keep moving in the direction of change. All right, I want to take a, a little bit of a left turn here. I, I, preparing for this interview, uh, you spoke about living in the doorway between religion and psychology. Can you walk us through what you meant by that and, and how that came to be? That was an oh. interesting statement. Well, I'm, I'm a person of faith. I mean, I, uh, my, my religious faith has been important to me through most of my life with a uh, couple of year vacation into agnosticism. But other, <laughs> other, other than that, it's, it's been one of the most meaningful things in my life. When I was in graduate school, what I was told by the director of training was, well, if you have to believe stuff like that, keep it to yourself. And you would certainly never ask clients about their religious beliefs. Well, I, I obeyed, I wanted to get through graduate school. You know, sure. but, but why? I mean, given that spirituality is such an important part of life for a lot of people, not, not just me, you know, but, but for many people to be working with, why is that taboo? You know, why, why would I not have a conversation about that? Uh, and, and so it, it kind of, that role emerged for me of standing in the door between religion and psychology and passing things back and forth. So I wrote a book for pastors on practical psychology that they mm -hmm. could use. Uh, and I wrote books for psychotherapists on spirituality and how to explore mm. that and what that means, you know. Uh, and for lay people on, on uh, positive belief and so forth. So it's just a fun place to be. Yeah. It was not a problem for William James at the turn of the <laughs> 19th century. His most famous book is Varieties of Religious Experience. Wonderful, interesting book, by the way. And for him, as a philosopher, and a really early psychologist, it was just perfectly natural to be interested in, in what's going on with this and what's, you know, what's really happening uh, with, with religious belief and how does that affect people. It, it became taboo in psychology kind of in the middle of the 20th century. 
Uh, and I, I sometimes say it was like psychology going through its adolescence because psychology arose from philosophy and religion. That's, that's, that's where its roots are historically. And it was almost like we had to say, I am not my parents. I am not like my parents. <laughs> I don't believe that stuff. And then toward the end of the 20th century, what you see is psychology starting to say, you know, maybe my parents knew something you know, and being interested in, uh, in religion and in spirituality and how you incorporate that into being helpful. Uh, psychologists uh, as a profession are far less religious than the people that they treat. Uh, but that mm. doesn't mean that you should never have that conversation. So, so that's just one thing that kind of emerged as a natural role for me uh, as a psychologist and a person of faith to say, well, what do we have here that we can share? Right. Right. Wow. Uh, all right. So one of the things you said in the, the interview you did with addictions in, in the addictions journal, you, you noted, I'm going to read a long quote here. So there have been various points in my life where I have just felt like I belonged with something. That's the direction I should go in. It is subtle, but it's a little tugging in a way. And whenever I've paid attention and followed one of those amazing things have come out of it. Now, when I read that, something in it made me wonder if that personal experience laid the groundwork for MI's development. It, it, is that, yeah, is that kind of where that came from or no, you're talking about something completely different? No, that was a part of it, of, of being, you know, hearing some possibilities and saying, you know, I think, I think we could talk some more about this or explore this some more. And, and that was really how the initial conversations happened in Norway. Um, I wasn't talking when, when I was working with the psychologist there uh, and teaching them behavioral approaches to treating alcohol problems. We began having these conversations also about well, how do you actually do this in practice? And they wanted me to demonstrate what I was doing. <clears throat> and, and they did what my American students rarely did, which was interrupt me uh, and ask good questions. So I'd be in the middle of role playing with a, with one of the psychologists who was portraying a client, and somebody was saying, no, "Hold on a minute, now, what are you thinking right now?" Or you asked a question there, but you could have asked a lot of questions. Why do you ask that question? Mm. You reflected something, but the client said a lot of things. Why did you reflect that instead of something else? And I didn't know the answer to it. <sighs> Uh, I was doing something that I wasn't conscious of, and together we began to unpack it. Uh, and one of the essential pieces of it was arranging the conversation in a way that it's the client who makes the argument for change rather than me. <clears throat> I didn't know I was doing that. Well, I didn't have any theory behind it. You know? But together we began to look at that and, and put together what was the very beginning of motivational interviewing to some basic guidelines that led to the first article that I wrote in 1983, I figured that's the last I would hear of it. You know? and in fact, it took over my life <laughs> largely. <laughs> it, it just is it, amazing staying power. <clears throat> I know 61 languages where this is being taught and practiced. Wow. Wow. So it crosses cultures pretty well. And, it, and ambivalence is one piece of it. That, that, that's such a uh, an embedded part of human nature that all of us experience. Uh, and we also all kind of know that telling us what to do isn't a great idea. And so how do you put that together into a way of being helpful? And so, yeah, being curious about that and just kind of following. This was one of those places where um, I felt that. It was just kind of intuitive and thought, I think this is worth pursuing. Wow. Quantum change was another one. Uh, let's not ignore that one. I, talk us through quantum change. That, it's super fascinating. What uh, can you give us a short version of what you developed there? <clears throat> well, I just got interested in sudden dramatic yeah. changes that are permanent. That you've gone through a one-way door. The, the fictional version of this is Ebenezer Scrooge. Right. But it happens in real life, and it happens pretty often in real life. And I, I, I had several, I'd seen several of these things happen. 
And I thought, no, if, if this can happen, if in a matter of minutes or hours, something can happen to a person that causes them to, to change benevolently, permanently, don't you think we should be interested in that? As yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't even have a name for it. It's what William James was writing about in 1902. And he talked about type two change. Type, type one is the way most of us change most of the time. Uh, kind of two steps forward, one step back, a little mm -hmm. bit at a time, successive approximations. But these are more like shooting the rapids. And these, these things happen. So I, so I just set out to see, can we understand this? And we had no trouble finding people that had had this experience, interviewed them and told the stories basically. Uh, and that, that book uh, created a great deal of inattention in psychology. And I figure it'd be another century before somebody else comes across it and writes about it again. But because literally William James was the last person I could find in psychology who had written about this wow. a century before. So I, to me, it's one of the most interesting things that we ever did research wise, but it hasn't really gone anywhere except to say that this really happens. Uh, and, and if it does happen to someone, it's helpful to be talking to somebody who understands it, uh, who knows this is not weird, strange, crazy, you know, uh, that there is a real phenomenon here and it does, it does occur. Um, and, and so just that was really the bottom line of the book that, yep, it happens. The, the editor wanted me to write one more chapter, how you too can have a quantum change. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the natural question. <laughs> and, and it sounds like that chapter didn't get added to the it book. It didn't get written. I said, sorry, I don't know the answer to that one. I'm observing these things and they're they are impressive. And they, they just happen to people out of the blue, uninvited. It's not like they were trying to do something. Uh, sometimes in the midst of great suffering, but just as often in the midst of everyday life, nothing out of the ordinary going on. Mm. Uh, and so there, I think there's a, there is a phenomenon there to understand. Uh, I wrote about it and I still get, this is uh, 17 years later, I, I still get uh, probably a letter a month via email now from somebody that found the book and said, this is what happened to me. Yeah, I didn't know yeah, this yeah. happened to other people. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so so there were not patterns that showed up of because I remember reading about this and how you invited people and you had the Scrooge picture or, or yeah, film, yeah. film mm -hmm. clip or whatever and and people were like oh my gosh yes that totally happened to me but in talking to those folks there were patterns but there was no spark there was no catalyst for creating that that you discovered in that in that research no no consistent one no and. And every last one of them had a sense of it being done to them or being uh, a recipient of it, of being passive. Huh. So nobody took credit for it. Interesting. No, nobody said, I did this. You know, quite the opposite. You know, I didn't do this. When this was <laughs> happening to me, I knew I wasn't doing this. I knew something out of the ordinary was happening, huh. but it wasn't me doing it. Now, there, there are all kinds of explanations of that, but but uh, that was the normal subjective experience of it, that, that they were having an experience that was not of their own origin. And it changed them profoundly, benevolently, and forever. Uh, wow. it, it was so different from addiction treatment, which is where I've done most of my life work, where you're hanging on for dear life to not go back to your previous pattern. These folks went through a one-way door and they knew it. They, they, they knew they were not just going back. Wow. Uh, couldn't uh, right. even. You know? right. So that just interested me. So that, that piece of my work sits out there still in book form, oh. uh, not having done much else, but one of my favorite children. Anyhow. <laughs> so we talked before we hit the record button of, hey, would, would it be fun to do a little sampling? You talked about the role playing you did in Norway, the, the demonstration stuff. If, if it's okay with you, let's give this a shot. One of the things I've been wanting to do more effectively, more consistently is journaling. And, and I know it's valuable. I encourage other people to do it. I've done it on and off for probably 40 of my 55 years, but I'm not consistent. And I, I think it'd be good. Like if you asked me that one to 10 question, I'd be like, yeah, I, I really want to do it. But then I 
don't. I, I probably journal a day a week. And I think four or five days a week would be mm -hmm. incredibly valuable. But can we run with that just for a few minutes, give people a sense of how MI works in a real situation? Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, so a day a week doesn't do it for you. That's not from some perspective, at least from some part of you, that's not enough. Yeah, it, it, it's okay. It, it just feels like if there's value from one, doggone it, why am I not doing this more often? Hmm. But there is a part of you that's, that's okay with once a week too. It says, yeah, that's, um, that's where I am. That's all right. Well, maybe like I, I probably wouldn't bring this up if I felt totally OK with that. Yeah, but I it falls down the priority list. I, I have other things I need to get to. I've got other priorities that for that morning, that day, I elevate above journaling. Yeah, yeah, and naturally. Well, what I mean, tell me then why, why would it be important to do this more than you are doing it now to kind of increase the how often you're journaling? couple things. One is I tend not to sit very well. And I think the journaling forces me to sit in one place mm -hmm. to think things through to contemplate a little bit. Whereas when I'm doing 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 I, that contemplation is not taking place, the learning is not taking place. You talked about the value of voicing something when I write something down, it, it clarifies it in my head. So it's not as jumbled as it was. So mm -hmm. those would be some of the reasons that I see a value in doing it more often. You get clearer about things when you're journaling mm -hmm. and you like that. I do. And there's something about sitting peacefully and not being in your usual do it, do it, do it, do it rhythm that is also good. Right. That, that somehow is valuable to you. What, how so? I think it, it probably is just a, a pause button of some sort. And again, as I'm saying that, mm -hmm. I'm hearing myself having said two minutes ago, I don't because I don't pause. So it, it's almost like the solution is affected by the cause, which I guess is probably true of a lot of issues in our lives. Yeah, yeah. So just the pausing itself is really what you're looking at doing more. Pausing and collecting. You to do that. Yeah, yeah, pausing, pausing but then <laughs> collecting and 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 learn. I I I I love to grow. I love to learn, and the journaling I feel like helps me take conversations like we're having, or a book I've read, or something Suzanne and I have talked about, or something the kids are telling me about in their lives, and it helps me to to bring all of those crazy pieces from all these different spots and put it into something that at least for that moment makes sense. Something peaceful about that, it sounds like. It's kind of centering or settling in a way. Yeah, you know? settling and collecting. It, it, it formats it. It's almost like it takes all these various dots on a map and, and gives them purpose, connects those dots. You get a lot of bang for the buck in a way. Huh? It feels like it. Uh-huh. So what, what you're doing already is good. But you have the sense that actually doing a bit more of this would be even better. Exactly. Exactly. Well, what would be ideal for you, do you think, in terms of how often you would want to journal? I think if I were journaling three to four times a week consistently, not on for three weeks and then off for six months, but consistently three to four times a week, mm -hmm. I think there'd be a lot of value to that. That'd be a big change from... from it would be. Once a week. Yep. Yeah. Well, you know a lot about yourself. What, how might you move in that direction? How, how do you think you could do it to actually begin to increase how often your journal? I could write it into my calendar. So it's a thing. Um, I that makes put, it real in a way. Makes it real. Have it in the calendar. Uh -huh. Yeah, I have a stack of books that sit next to a window I, I sit at each morning. I could put it on top so it's the first thing that I get to. Or I literally have to purposely move it out of the way. So it's like I'm making a conscious decision instead of, oh, I didn't get to it. I have to make a I would have to make a conscious decision to say, nope, not journaling today. 
So maybe moving it from unconscious to conscious could be helpful. Huh. Huh. There's an old, old psychological principle in there too, that when you want to increase something, you do it before the thing that you're more inclined to do. So if you got a book you want to read, journals on top, do a little of that. Now you can read your book. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I see that. Yeah. And you would it'd be, you'd be conscious then of making a decision. I'm not going to journal today. Right. And something about that feels helpful to you. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think the phone probably gets in the way too. Emails coming through, mm. distractions. So potentially putting the phone in a different place instead of having it next to me uh, would allow me to focus in a little bit more. Oh, it might. Yeah, just to get the immediate distraction. Mm -hmm. When the email hits, you want to go read it right away. Or the right. phone rings, you have to answer it right away. Right. So this is taking... Not just a pause, but a space in, in some ways to just have a, some time to journal, to reflect. Right. How, how long is, is useful for you to journal when you're doing it? Uh, that would vary, and I, I wouldn't be particular about that. I think 10 minutes would be fine, 20, 25 yeah. minutes would be great. I, it would never be more than that unless I'm yeah. really into some great brainstorm. But um, yeah, 10, 15, 20 minutes would be wonderful. And, and let me ask you the scale. How important is this to you as, as something that would be a part of your life? Ten, this is the most important thing in my life. Zero is, doesn't matter at all. What number would you give yourself? Based on my actions, it's probably a five. Um, I would probably yeah. give it a, a five, but the other side of my brain says, but Brad, think if it were consistent, that could, so probably a seven. The five is kind of what you're doing. Yeah. But something else in you says, but it, no, it's about a seven. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why, why seven and not five? I, I think just thinking about um, the things we talked about of clarifying, of collecting growth opportunities and ideas for the future. And, and even down the road, I, I would love to get my parents' journals from. 30 years worth and see what oh. they were thinking about and learning and growing and struggling with. And, and, and maybe someday my kids when I'm long gone can go through that and say, wow, that's interesting. Dad was really struggling in this area or wow, this is where he was learning in this area. And, and maybe it'd be helpful to them in some way. As well as to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you have a lot of reasons to do this. That, I that do. <laughs> I mean, you like, you like the, just the kind of the peaceful pause of taking time to reflect on what's happening in your life and actually write it down to 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever. Uh, and that that somehow helps you pull things together in a way that might not happen otherwise when you're in your busy life. Even imagine this kind of being preserved and something that passes on to your children as a, as a reflective journal of, oh, this is what, this is what dad was really like. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's just that habit has gotten in the way of you doing it a little more. It's not, not a huge change either, but from one, from one day a week to three, maybe. Uh, so how, how can you get yourself there? How can you actually start that pattern of reliably having more than one day a week? Yeah, I, I think things that I was going to say we talked about, but basically you got me to talk about is, putting the phone in a different place, putting the journal on top, uh, and then literally putting it on my calendar three different days a week because I like checking those things off, Doug, on it. So if it's oh, on there, I'm probably going to do it. So uh -huh. I would say those would be my three primary steps. would be phone away, journal on top, and put it on the calendar for three different days. That might be enough. Yeah. 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 Very good. Are you willing to do that? I am willing to do all three of those. Yeah. Well... Curious if you will. Sounds good. I will check back with the, with the, with the gang. Thank you. Yeah. I think that was helpful for people to kind of see that uh, live and in person. Just a couple more questions. Um, and but, you touched but on before you, Oh yeah. Before you do, what yeah. was, what was it like being on the receiving end of this? What was, what was happening? You know, I live in the coaching world, so I'm married to this genius counselor slash coach who does this stuff with me all the time. I call it her Jedi mind powers. And so I have a 
fortunate advantage of being able to think these through with her basically using MI through that process. So it was not unfamiliar. It wasn't, oh no, this feels weird, but it was very helpful. Uh-huh. 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 Just to hear yourself saying why it matters. Yes. And, and be very specific. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yes. Okay. All right. So last Go couple, ahead. um, 1983, like what is it about MI motivational interviewing that has resulted in such a long lasting impact? We're talking, what is that? 40 years? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, honestly, I don't know. I mean, it, it's something about human nature that people recognize. And that seems to be the word that when, when people learn about this, hear about it, read about it, it's not like they're encountering something alien, but they react as you did at the beginning of the interview. What factor that makes perfect sense. You know? yeah. and, and sometimes a, an attraction of, you know, that's how I'd like to be with people. That's, I mean, that's how I'd like to do my work as a helper, or that's how I'd like to be with my friends. Uh, I, I'd like to know some more about that. So it, it's, it has a kind of natural, appeal to what we know about ourselves as people um, and just a benevolent way of of being so that that part of you that is drawn toward being a helper being helpful to others it kind of resonates or recognizes this and says yeah actually that makes sense i'd like to try that and then happily uh, you see results often pretty quickly as you do that people respond very differently to this than to being told what's wrong with them and what to do. Uh, and so you can also get that immediate feedback. And essentially, if, if you're doing this professionally, your clients teach you how to do it. Last question. You retired, and I'm going to put that in quotes because you just showed us the book that you wrote, uh, the most recent book, in 2006. So 15, 16 years What's life been like? How's it been different? And what do you see coming in the next five, 10 years? What's, what's around the corner for you? I don't know the answer to the latter one. Yeah, and even <laughs> when people say, where's motivational interviewing going in 10 years? I don't know. I'm just kind of following the road and fascinated to see where it goes. Uh, there's a, a wonderful quote from Teilhard de Chardin. I'm content uh, to follow this path right to the end. Uh, along a road more and more familiar toward an horizon more and more shrouded in mist. So mm. I'm sure of the path I'm on. It feels right. I know where I'm going. I have no idea where it's going, but I'm content to do that. I'm content to walk right to the end on that path. So I have that feeling about my life, uh, where, wherever that were to end, it's been an amazing journey already. Um, so I, you know, I'm not sure where that goes. What's different is is just lower demands. Mm. Uh, so I don't have um, clients. I don't have students to supervise. I don't have classes to teach. I don't have faculty meetings to attend. I don't have so many must dos on the calendar. Uh, sometimes my calendar is empty for the week, which is wonderful. <laughs> uh, and I I can say, what would I like to do today? How would I like to spend this day of my life? So that's different. It, it's, I'm not, it, I haven't been bored. Uh, and it's not that I'm doing nothing. I'm still writing books. I'm still doing podcasts sometimes when invited. I mean, just, you know, this kind of thing is enjoyable. Uh, I have a little more time to travel also, which is something that I really enjoy. So I think it's, it's more sense of a freedom to choose what I'm going to do. Mm. and a responsibility to choose what I'm doing uh, as well. That wasn't so much the case when my life was highly structured and scheduled. Uh, and, and that's different. Uh, but I'm, I'm not dead. I'm just retired. So I, I am still uh, involved in things that I enjoy. And I see my family and you know, have good conversation with people. Life is good and have not been able to kick the habit of writing books. <laughs> we are glad about that. Keep that up. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't break that habit. Dr. Miller, th this was such a privilege. We, we had the Prochaskas on our 100th episode. We get to have you on our 200th episode. This was fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time with us. You're most welcome.